Hello guys, welcome to our YouTube channel VLSI Chefs and today we are back with another interesting video based on introduction of microprocessors. So previously we talked about the embedded systems, basics of embedded system and what are those, how they work and what is the use cases of that embedded systems in our real life. Now we will deep dive into each and every module that plays one critical part to perform a whole embedded system. So let's start first with the microprocessors. Now we have a question that what is called a microprocessor? So assume we have a computer in our home, right? We all have worked on a computer. The core part of that computer is central processing unit which is called CPU. It is of huge size. And within that CPU, we have various blocks which, which are supposed to do various tasks. So the idea of the whole CPU is like whenever user executes or gives any command to the computer, computer, computer should, should behave, behave likewise. likewise. So, so the, the job, job of the CPU was to take the instructions, perform those instructions in a way that it gives reliable user output. Now what if we build a whole CPU in a single integrated circuit. Yeah, that is correct. It is nothing but a microprocessor. So what microprocessors basically are, they are an electronic device that will read binary instruction from a particular storage device which is called memory. They will accept the binary data as an input and then process those data. And based on those instructions, the processing will happen and based on that, it will provide a particular reliable output. So over the period of time, there are various types of microprocessors that came into the picture. So the first microprocessor was of 4 bit. So it can able to process 4 bits of data simultaneously. So 4 bit microprocessor was able to do arithmetic and logic operations on 4 bits of data. Later on, it evolved and we got 8 bit of microprocessor. So previously, the same job which we were able to do on 4 bit of data, now it can able to do on 8 bits of data. The later on, we got 16 bit of data, which acts as in mini computers, because the more number of bits you are processing upon, the more powerful that particular microprocessor becomes. We can say that n bit of microprocessor can have 2 raised to n number of data storage capacity. So over the period of time, we got 32 and 64 bit microprocessors as well. In latest 64 bit of microprocessor, we can have more than one processor embedded in a whole system. So you can imagine how powerful this microprocessor has become and how powerful that whole system will have in which there is multi-processing units. So we can say that over the period of time, the revolution of microprocessor is quite huge. Correct? So now let's talk about the architecture of the microprocessor. So if you see the block diagram of whole microprocessor, then it will contain a various unit, units or blocks. So in the core part of the microprocessor has various elements like arithmetic and logic unit, control unit and register. With this microprocessor, we have an external memory which is connected via bus, data bus or address bus or control bus. And also this microprocessor is communicating with the input or output device. Now this input or output device can be anything like keyboard, mouse or any external mic. So in this microprocessor, if we talk about the control unit, then the main job of the control unit is to control the transmission of the data from one unit to the another. So basically this control unit will fetch the instructions, it will decode that instruction and will tell processor to behave in certain mode of operation. It also communicates with input and output device to control the data, to control the transmission of the data as well as instructions. Once the control unit has done its job, 
the arithmetic and logic unit will come into the picture. So control unit will transfer, will control the transfer of data and instruction, while arithmetic and logic unit will perform the data processing. So this data processing can include any operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, or logical operations like and, or, not, XOR, and likewise. So in order to perform all these data processing instructions, there are there, there should, should be some, some temporary storage element like register. So in order to store these interpreted in intermediate results while performing arithmetic and logic units, microprocessor will use its own register. It has also memory. We will come back to the memory as well. But for storage for temporary storage of the data of arithmetic and logical unit has processed, those we can store in registers. Now let's talk about the memory. So this memory is connected with microprocessor via external buses. So we have two or can say three data buses, three buses. One is data bus, second is address bus in control bus. So control unit will do the control, controlling of data and instruction via this control bus. In data bus, it is bidirectional. The reason is the transfer of the data or the instruction can happen in both the ways to and from from the microprocessor as well as the memory. If we talk about the address bus, then microprocessor will direct or get, tell the address of particular location to the memory. So it is single way. Once the microprocessor will give the address to that memory, the instructions and the data will be processed or can be stored in that particular location. So memory we have two different types. One is read-only memory and the another is random access memory. So there are the programs which are permanently stored. We know that this particular chunk of program is going to get executed every time the microprocessor wakes up or turns on. So that part of the program should be there irrespective of whether the processor is powered on or not. So those irmodifiable program we can store in read-only memory. In random access memory, we can store various results of the data processing operations. So whatever the output we got from the uh, arithmetic and logical unit, we can store into the RAM. And whenever required, we can fetch that particular output and transfer it to the respective input or output device. So this is the whole architecture. Now based on the storage of instructions and data within the memory, we have another two types and those are nothing but the one human architecture and the Howard architecture. So let's understand this first. The one human architecture is supposed to be called as an ancient or the old architecture. This was used in our old or the first generation of the microprocessors. As a part of an improvement, as microprocessors evolved, based on the requirement, the power consumption and all the other characteristics, we came up with a new architecture which is more reliable and sophisticated compared to the one human architecture. So the main difference between these two architecture is how the data and instructions are transmitted between the memory and CPU. So if we talk about the one human architecture, then a single set of data and address bus is assigned in between memory and CPU. So what happens that two clock cycles is supposed to be required in order to perform one single operation. Let's understand how. So the first clock cycle CPU will use in order to fetch the instruction from the memory. It will process that instruction 
and based on the instruction it will perform the logical operations on the data. Once it will get the reliable output of the data, it will again store that data into the memory. And to store that data into the memory, it will require another clock cycle. So this is how the whole execution will be performed. And to execute this, it will require two clock cycles because the operations will be in serial form. Now, if we talk about the Harvard ar architecture, then a separate set of the buses is assigned to two separate memories and, th and that is program memory and the data memory. So what happens is at the same time in single clock cycle CPU can fetch the instruction from the program memory and also store the data on the other side in the data memory. So this improves the execution of the program. And as we discussed earlier that we can store the permanent programs which are supposed to be executed in every cycle, in every boot up cycle of the processor. So we can store those program or those instruction in program memory permanently. So Harvard architecture has improved the performance of microprocessors. So this is what the main difference between one Newman and Harvard architecture was. We can see that now in modern computers, Harvard architecture is used. The next is the working of the microprocessor. So in previous slides, we have already seen that how particular microprocessor works when we were discussing about the architecture of the microprocessor. Yet revisit Let's revisit it again. So first of all, what microprocessor will do? It will fetch the instruction from the particular memory, which will be basically the read-only memory or the RAM. From the fetching the memory from the RAM, it will then decode, interpret that particular instruction. Once it will interpret that instruction, that what specific uh, job that instruction is supposed to do based on that it will process that particular instruction and how it will do that it will execute it it will process the data based on the execution of that particular instruction once the output of that execution has been re re retrieved we will get one specific data and that particular output data will be stored again into the memory so this is how it will work. Now based on the architecture of the performance of microprocessor, we have two different classification. One is CISC and another is RISC. So based on the name itself, we can say that CISC has more complex set of instructions while RISC has reduced set of instruction. Now let's understand this with the help of one example. For an example, I'm supposed to write one program to perform one specific task. I can write that particular program in two ways. Either I can write a program with one single instruction, which will perform two or three multiple tasks. By that way, I can have less number of instruction, but my purpose, my job will be survived. In the another way, what I can do is I can write a single instruction based on the single task that I'm supposed to do. In this case, as my number of tasks will get increased, the number of instruction will also get increased because I'm not including two or more tasks within single instruction. So here the same scenario is in these architectures as well. The first scenario which we discussed is nothing but the complex instruction architecture where in single instruction there are multiple micro instructions that are included so at the time of execution more than one instruction is supposed to get executed and to execute that a processor will have will require more number of instruction cycles clock cycles we can say because the instructions are complex enough to execute it in multiple clock cycles 
while the second approach which we uh, suggested which was replicated to this reduced instruction set architecture where the number of instructions are high or large but each and every instruction will have a single clock cycle to get executed so the number of clock cycles per instruction will be higher in case of cisc architecture while it will be lesser in the in case of risc architecture while the number of instruction will be lesser in cisc architecture and number of instruction will be higher in risc architecture so to understand this in a very modular or block diagram form you can see that in risc there are machine instruction and that instructions will get directly executed while in cisc there are machine machine instructions but within that machine instructions we have we have to do micro code conversion in which we need to uh, identify each and every uh, micro instructions and based on that we need to execute those in order to perform the whole execution of machine instruction now let's talk about the difference in both the architecture based on their characteristic so when we talk about the memory unit then risc architecture has no memory unit while cisc has some memory elements to store the reason is risc has very less number of instruction and very easy instruction that can be executed in single instruction cycle and those instruction are basically implemented in hardware itself so there is no memory requirement to store those instructions while in cisc the instruction set is quite complex and due to that to store each and every micro instruction we need some storage device when it comes to program then like we said it is hardwired in case of risc because the control unit generates the control signal directly based on the logic circuits or hardware circuits while in case of cisc the control unit generates the control signals based on the micro instructions that is stored in the memory so it is micro programmed architecture when it comes to compiler design then risc has complex compiler while cisc has easy the reason is risc has many num n number of instructions to execute in number of instructions in risc are higher than the cisc so accordingly the com compiler should also need to execute more number of instruction so for that we need complex compiler while in cisc as the code length or the program length is quite less compared to risc we need very simple compiler design which can easily convert a set of instruction into an assembly code when it comes to calculation or decoding the cisc has very fast calculation and execution you can say while cisc has very slow decoding mechanism the reason is obviously cisc has very less uh, very uh, less complex instructions which can be executed or decoded faster and easily while in cisc due to complexity of the instruction the decoding becomes slow and calculation are also becomes complex so accordingly the execution time of risc architecture and cisc architecture are varies so the decoding becomes easy so execution time is also less in case of cisc architecture risc architecture while decoding becomes very slow and due to that the execution time is increased in case of cisc architecture and the very common point between these two and the major point is that number of cycle clock cycle per instruction is very less in case of risc because each and every instruction will have majorly one clock cycle while in case of cisc the number of clock cycle per instruction will be higher because a single instruction is complex enough to utilize more than one clock cycle so this is what the difference we talked about now let's talk about the applications of the microprocessor 
So microprocessor has made our human life very easier with the help of low cost, lightweight, low power controllers or processors embedded within the devices that are being used in our day-to-day -day life. If we talk about household appliances, then high-end coffee makers, washing machine, refrigerators, they include a microprocessor chip within that. In industrial applications and automobile industries like vehicles, elevators, heavy machinery which requires very time crucial decision making scenarios when, com when it comes to microprocessor. Also in computers and electronics field where a single starting from the microcomputer till the supercomputer all the ranges of the computer includes one single microprocessor which are of various kinds. In instrumentation and control field, we have very various function generators, frequency counters, frequency synthesizers, spectrum analysis, where it, it requires a time crucial decision making system. There also microprocessor comes into the picture. Microprocessor has also made satellite communication and television teleconferencing possible. We are able to communicate from one planet to the other planet with the help of this system. Also, various microprocessor technology using LAN and WAN, we are able to perform various railway reservation and airline reservation. So we can say microprocessor is now our core part of our human life without which we cannot survive. So yeah, that is all guys. You can make the most with VLSI chaps. You can be the part of our core team creating content. You can contact at max underscore chap on Elidam. You can learn various VLSI as well as embedded related tutorials or valuable videos on our YouTube channel VLSI chaps. You can have all the information or questions and answers as well as material on our website www.vlsijabs.com You can also interact in our telegram groups of vlsijabs and vlsi underscore jabs underscore channel where you can interact with the students or the knowledge givers and help other people to gain the knowledge. We have also our Quora space where people ask the question, also answer the question and transfer the knowledge. You can follow VSI Chats on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter and on various medium. So you can help the community to grow by sharing VSI Chats on our social media because more the helping hands we have, the huge family will become and ultimately we will have more opportunities and more learning. We also share various job opportunities. So you can keep eye on our job opportunities group. Thank you guys. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Please do like, share and subscribe our YouTube channel. See you guys in the next one.